So um, I am the Careers and Progression Assistant here at Long Road. My name is Emma and joining us today, uh, we have Lincoln University um, to talk about uh, digital fakery, I believe. Yep. You ready to go? Yep. Shall I start? Okay. So my name is Martin. I'm a lecturer at the University of Lincoln in the Fine Arts Department. Um, I teach on the undergraduate course and the postgraduate course and if you don't know the difference I'm sure you do but I, I may as well assume no knowledge um, I'm talking about a first degree the one that you would go on to from school as the undergraduate which is a three-year course and then a postgraduate course or a master's degree that you can only do once you've got a degree so I teach across all three years of the undergraduate course and I co-lead the master's course and currently I'm sat in the master's, the MA studio, as we call it. And I can have my mask off because there's no one else in there at the moment. Um, and I'm going to tell you about a project I'm doing on the MA, which is obviously not directly um, linked to the undergraduate course that you might be interested in coming on to, but you'll see it is. The principles are still sort of there. Um, and also because I was asked to do a talk about something kind of current affairs -y, I've, um, I've been thinking about post-truth politics, but that's really a little bit of an undercurrent to the talk. Um, well, we'll see how it goes, but I'm gonna focus on some technical aspects and facilities that we have at the university and teaching methods and so on. So I can remember being 18 and on a foundation course at, um, in Maidstone in Kent, which is where I'm from, and having students who had previously studied that course come back to tell us about their degrees in fine arts or design disciplines. And one of the questions one of my colleagues asked them was, how do you manage your time? How do you, what's it like being at university? You know, for three years, do you just, you go into a studio and paint all day for, for three years? And um, the, the student gave an answer. And I'll give you a slightly different answer now, which is that things have changed a bit since I went to university. So when I went, I did a degree in painting and it kind of was like that actually. And that's good training in a way because as an artist, um, you're self-employed. No one's gonna tell you what to do for an hour. You would have to work you know, in, in blocks, um, whole days, long days, and so on. So that's, that's okay. But now, um, especially at Lincoln, especially at Lincoln, we have a very modularized course um, with regular teaching sessions. And I, I would challenge you, um, if you're thinking of doing fine arts, to look around different courses and see how much contact time you get with teachers. Um, and I think that Lincoln will be very favorable. So that's a little bit about the, the, the BA, but um, if, if anything, we've become very professionalized and maybe too taught in, in a way. So my colleague Andrew and I, with the master students, and if you've got to remember they're a bit older, um, all of them are over 21, but a lot of them have, are returning to study after a gap, so they could be a lot older. Um, we thought we would try to do a project that looks at the use of the studio. So how, how long are you in the studio? Uh, and when you're in, what are you doing? Like, are, you, are you productive and so on? So we put in a um, teaching and learning bid. So we have pots of money to do projects at the university. And we bid to do a project about studio culture and we bought these, they're time-lapse cameras, um, which means they record like 30 frames a minute and it will be sped up. So I'm recording, I'm in the studio this week and I'm in here and I will be recorded all week, everything I do on two cameras, and we will play that back to the students later and it will be sped up so that they can see what I'm doing. And the idea is um, to set an example and to do, do good practice, to show how much work you can do in just a week, which is a bit daunting because if I don't do that, um, I'm gonna fall on my face. So um, both my colleague Andrews, he's already done his week and I'm doing a week, <clears throat> but we have to do it, we think, because we are going to um, film the students later. 
And if we're asking them to do it, and it sounds a bit big brother, like, you know, what are you doing? We're not going to tell them off or anything. It's, it's post-compulsory education at university. You don't have to be here. And, and we know that they, you know, there are reasons why artists might not be in the studio. They might be uh, in the library researching something. They might be on location sketching something. They might be editing uh, a video in a Mac suite. They might be um, doing performance art. They might book a dance studio or a drama studio out to be doing that. There's lots and lots of reasons why they might be in different places. And especially in the middle of a pandemic, um, that, yeah, the, there are reasons. So it's not a disciplinary thing at all. It's just we want to look at how people use the studio and uh, how we could use it better and so on. So we're recording it for a week. Now, of course, I've got to do something for that week. I can't, um, I could just turn up and start drawing as possible. In fact, I did a postgraduate diploma, which is kind of like between degree and masters at the Cypress College of Arts. And I remember that's how I started. I started drawing my studio and just working in that way. I could do it that way, but I, I had some, um, a project idea that was kind of evolving. So I've been working on that so that when I come in, I'm extremely organized and um, I can get on and have work to do. Which is a learning curve because actually for the last four years, I've mainly not been making art. I've, although it's my background, I've trained in painting at undergraduate and postgraduate level. Um, I've been doing a lot of research and writing journal articles and I'm working on a book. So I've been busy doing that, which means, and I've only been living in Lincoln for five years. So I, um, maybe I'm not so familiar with how to access materials and, and so on here. So it's a really good learning curve. I, now I know what I ask my students to do is achievable or not, where they can get stuff and so on, how long orders take over the internet and that kind of thing. So let me tell you about the project, which is to do about with digital painting, fakery and truth and the, the kind of current affair is post-truth, remember. Going back quite a way now, not to do with this learning and teaching project before I knew about this, I made 30 paintings on paper. Um, with gouache. If you don't know gouache, it's a bit like watercolour, but more matte. Here's, here is one of the paintings. And um, then I scanned the 30 paintings. So there's a reason why they're, you know, they're A3-ish, so that they're more or less human head size, a bit bigger. Uh, and they fit in the scanner, <laughs> so I can scan them. And then I um, used a graphics tablet and some open source digital painting software to manipulate them, edit them and change them. Um, so at this point, you've got to imagine you've got a digital file which contains two types of mark. It contains a facsimile of an analog mark, which means a scan of that which was painted by hand. That took me about half an hour. Um, so they're quite quick sketches. So you've got the, the facsimile of that and you've got the certain marks that are only digital. And they were, you know, I made the brushes and stuff. I'm getting quite into that. You can edit brushes and, and do all sorts of stuff um, using this software. Then let me just grab um, an example. Then I, I printed them onto canvas here at the university. We have a canvas printer. So that's, that's another one. Actually, that one's a failure. The ink didn't come out right. So I've got another version of that that I can show you in a minute that's slightly better colors. So now what you've got is a physical um, canvas. And I've stretched them up. So if I reach behind me and grab this, which is wet but you can see it's it looks like it's come through on the back there i'll explain that um why in a minute but it's a physical thing that looks like a painting but it's not it's a print but there are uh, but there are two types of mark printed again so now we have, have a printed facsimile of a gouache painting and a printed set of digital marks and i'm interested in challenging the audience to see whether they can tell whether it's a painting or a print. 
so far. I've had lots of people come in this week, they can't tell. In fact, one person knew I was doing this project and said, where are the prints? They look like paintings. Um, but also, can you tell which is the digital mark? That's what I'm, I'm interested in. And in some cases, it's really obvious. Maybe um, you might not see it through the camera. Of course, this is all about the physicality of paint uh, and you need to see it in person, really. But if you were to look at this bottom corner here, I reckon that looks pretty digital. Maybe you can't tell, so take my word for it, if not. Um, but then I've got more tricky. I bought this. It's called Liquitex Gloss Gel Medium. And it's, um, it's really thick, like butter. I don't know if you can see it, but it's not, it's not pouring out. And you can paint with it onto um, the surface of the canvas and it will retain the brush strokes. So everything that's on there, of course, that's printed is flat. So to a degree, you're looking at a flat image, you might guess that it's a print. But I'm painting over it with this, it dries completely transparent, but retains the brush strokes. So I can model and mold uh, brush strokes as if they were oil painting brush strokes. And then I'm painting on top of it with oils. So some of the ones behind me, the hair, is oil paint. You won't be able to see it through the lens. And again, because it's oil, you've got a texture to it and so on. So when you look at it, if you know anything about painting, you would think that's probably oil um, because it's got a texture to it. You can do that with acrylic. You can get binders and well, such as the medium I just showed you. Um, but you, you would probably be able to tell it's an oil painting. But of course, it's not an oil painting. It's oil on top of other um, types of mark. Now, before you can paint onto canvas, you have to seal it if you want to paint in oil because the oil will rot the canvas. There's a real irony here that the oil in oil paint is linseed oil and the uh, slight technical, let me show you my colleague's paintings. He's done them on, um, cam this is a type of canvas called linen and you can tell because it's gray. Um, so linen, the linvit and linseed oil, they've got the same roots. They come from the same plants. And it's, uh, it's ironic, I think, that the linseed oil will rot linen, but it will also rot canvas, what we call cotton duck canvas that I've got up there. So you have to seal it. And how would you seal it? Well, normally you would paint it with, um, you could paint it with emulsion, which is not artist quality and likely to fall apart. You should know that um, household paints are designed to fall apart every five to ten years so that you have to redecorate. So you don't really want to be doing that if you're an artist. But you can get um, quite affordable acrylic um, primers that, that are good. Some of them are called acrylic gessos. They're all good. But they're white and I would destroy my images and I wouldn't be able to see them. So there's not a lot of point printing them and then painting over them. So I bought something else called Lasco acrylic sizing, which um, dries transparent. So I can paint over them all the way over and it dries transparent. These have two coats of that on and that should be impregnable to oil. So when you see, do you remember I showed you the back of the canvas here and the face is showing through? If I were to be buying that, I might be thinking, oh, he hasn't um, sized the canvas properly and the oil's coming through and it's going to rot and fall apart. But in fact, that came through when I sized it. So it's some of the ink from the, um, from the prints and it's not dangerous at all in any way. The oil shouldn't come through at all. And I suppose I could test that by looking at where I've put a lot of oil paint on and looking at the back. You'll be able to tell that it's an oil coming through. Okay, so I'm gonna speak a lot about the technical aspects, but actually we can get into a kind of philosophical, the why am I doing it um, later? Um, and who are these people and you know, what am I painting? 
So you probably can't see, but I'm going to give it a go under the light. This is a, a painting. It's been sized. And then afterwards, I've added the that modelling medium, the gel medium. And if I catch it just right in the light, no, I don't think so. Maybe. Well, the point is, it's horrible. It looks like plastic. Um, so it's three dimensional when the brush strokes are there, but it's not very nice. And I knew that would happen. Well, I, I suspected that would happen. So I'll be painting over that with thinned down oil paint with turpentine to create a, a more matte effect. And I've been doing that this morning. And so far, not so good. It's still coming through quite a lot. So I may end up having to paint over that with a little bit more oil. Um, that's OK. We'll, we'll just see how it goes. So on the technical level that I've talked you through now, we have um, we, or we will have a painting, an oil painting, and some of the marks on there will be paint on canvas, physical paint on canvas. We'll call that analog painting. Some of it will be digital. Some of it will be an analog sketch that's been scanned. So it is a real handmade painterly mark. And if I just see that one, if I put it up, is you can see it's the one next to it. So the colours are quite different now. And I've, I've altered quite a lot in some cases, maybe even anatomically, the, the chins are a bit over that way and I can edit it digitally. Um, so those are the three marks, right? The gouache, the um, digital and the, the new analogue. But also it's further complicated because two of those printed marks are sometimes enhanced with a gel medium to make it look 3D. Yeah, that's basically the technical process. And it's, I, I want to see, can people tell? And I presented this project uh, last Friday at a digitalization steering group committee. And we have a conservation department upstairs and they said, who are you going to test this on? Can we have a go? And I thought that's brilliant because they are experts who um, should be able to tell by looking at something what it's made out of because they need to know if you come across a, an old painting, how's it been made and, and so on. Okay, you want to know um, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it now, I guess. I... Well, there are two drivers for this project. One is Donald Trump and post-truth. And the other is I was asked to do a talk um, on my painting practice and I hadn't really done any for two years because I've been working on written outputs. And I thought, what shall I do? I've got these back burner projects. I have a folder full of projects that I wanted. And at one point I was thinking I could talk about that, like artwork that I've not done. And one of those projects was um, based on a music video that I saw when I was 14. So in the year 1993, a rock band called Soul Asylum had a global hit called Runaway Train. Runaway Train's kind of about kids running away from home. And in the music video, at the beginning, they have these milk cartons with images of missing children, real missing children. Um, and it will say, you know, their name had been missing since this date call this number if you've seen them it's something they do in america the milk carton kids was a big campaign in the 80s 90s um and i was always interested years later i was thinking i wonder what happened to those kids um and then i found out that soul asylum did different videos for different countries so there there are there's a, spe a special video just for the missing children in britain um, they're not on milk cartons, but they flash up their faces at, in the video and say how long they've been missing and stuff. So, yeah, I was interested in that. And I'm also interested at the same time in this idea of post-truth. So what is post-truth? I'm going to tell you because I fit. I heard just the other week someone kind of get this wrong uh, here at the university. So it's not a given. Some people think it's about politicians lying, but I think it's very different. Politicians have always lied, but if they got caught lying, they would usually be um, embarrassed by this or care about it. 
But now we've entered into a situation where it doesn't seem to matter if you're caught lying. Um, you can brush it off. You've seen Donald Trump just say, oh, that's fake news. That's CNN. That's, oh, that's terrible. You, you're a disgrace, you New York Times journalist, you know, one of the most respected newspapers on the planet, really. And he can just go, you're a disgrace. You're partisan, meaning, you know, you're against me because I'm a Republican or, or whatever. And he's destabilized truth to the point that it's just um, equivalent to opinions or feelings. And you'll see him do that when he says things like, um, I'm not saying that all Mexicans are rapists, but people are getting raped and there's a lot of immigration from Mexico. Uh, so he's not presenting any evidence for that claim. And he's backing off by saying, I'm not saying it, but he's planting the idea. And really what he's saying is trust your feelings, your gut prejudice. Um, you know, you might, he might be able to win votes by saying things that people feel, whether it's true or not. So you could be, I could be a bit more incendiary and say something like, I'm imagining Donald Trump saying, uh, some, implying that black people are, are lazy. And a load of racist people will say, yeah, I thought that. And now the president's saying it, so it must be true. And then if someone discredits that claim with evidence, um, he doesn't have to respond to it. He just says, well, that's fake. But we all know, we, we feel something. So I, I don't like that. I think that's gone too far. And I've, I'm quite kind of quite into um, the idea that some things are not opinion. Some things are just true or not true. And when we, um, I'm gonna move and talk to show you some other paintings. When I was looking at these missing children from the Soul Asylum video, which will appear in the background there, um, I thought, there we go, I'll sit to the side. I thought, well, in law, generally speaking, things are not considered to be just opinion. Now, I'm not a legal expert here, and I'm sure it's a lot more grey than the black and white I'm going to paint it. But, um, yeah, like if, if someone's found with 14 stab wounds and they're dead, they've probably been stabbed to death. And if I'm accused of doing that, either uh, I did it or I didn't do it. And at least hypothetically, it's possible to arrive at the truth. There is a truth as to whether I've murdered someone or not. And that's not the same as the conviction. We might convict on faulty evidence. We can make mistakes. That's all true. But um, nonetheless, at least hypothetically, we could find out using, you know, there could be CCTV footage. There could be DNA evidence. There could be a, an eyewitness. All of these things may be individually don't prove something, but at least hypothetically, there is a truth. And likewise, there is a truth about what happened to these uh, people. They disappeared and I wondered what happened to them. So I thought I would investigate it. And there is a new, um, talking about kind of current affairs, there's a new vein in contemporary art um, called investigative art. And that is artists who are usually collectives, of artists who, as their practice, so they're not painters, they're not sculptors, they investigate things and they present the evidence. And in some cases, it is court submissible. So it actually is used as evidence. And the, the biggest, most famous artist group that does that is called Forensic Architecture. And they're based at Goldsmiths University um, in London. So what they do is they're in the architecture department. That's not just a, um, a fancy name. Um, what they've historically done is they would look at, um, say, a collapsed building in a war, and they would, using their architectural knowledge and computer modeling and all sorts of other things, they would work out how the building was destroyed. So, you know, well, there might be a case where you're, you're arguing over, was it blown up from within? Was it hit by a missile? What type of missile? How many missiles? And so on. So they would investigate that. But then it, it kind of also grows and they were nominated for the Turner Prize a couple of years ago for a piece that they did in Palestine, where um, I'll try and keep it as short as I can, but basically without going into the whole history of the Israel-Palestine conflict, but 
Israel has some occupied territories. It's not supposed to be populating them and, and building in them, and but it does sometimes. And in some cases, Israel evicts um, people so that they can build Israeli settlements in Palestinian land. That might sound partisan, like I'm being pro-Palestine and anti-Israeli, but I should point out that the main guy in, uh, in forensic architecture is an Israeli. Um, so I reckon he's probably not that bias in his account. So the, there was an eviction in the middle of the night and uh, in the exhibition, you see all of the video, it's all pieced together from activists footage on their mobile phones, on cameras, and then someone gets shot and killed and it's like quite shocking. And then you walk through this dark projection space into the gallery and um, there's all these kind of like Twitter tweets printed up and uh, evidence things that, that are going on. Basically, the Israeli government said um, someone drove a car at their police officers and injured one of them. I can't remember, maybe killed one of them. So they shot through the windscreen and killed him in self-defense. And they released thermal imaging um, footage from a helicopter to kind of substantiate this claim. But forensic architecture worked with the activists there to prove beyond all reasonable doubt that that was a fake claim. And the way they did it is they pieced together all of the different mobile phone footage and that contains GPS locators that proves it was there and metadata footage that proves the timing. And it might be that someone's got this rubbish, shaky footage um, and, and the sound's not working. And somebody else has got some footage that's too dark to see, but the sound is working, but you can piece together that the bullet was fired at that point there. They, they proved that he was shot um, and slumped onto the automatic car's accelerator and it rolled into the police. Uh, he was already dead when he drove it at the police. And they also did it using computer modeling and other stuff. And the other thing they did quite lo-fi, sounds a bit old fashioned now that we've got drones, is they used a weather balloon to film the landscape and pick up signs of ancient settlements there to prove that these um, supposedly nomadic Palestinian shepherds um, were, had actually been living there continuously for a long time. And they cross-referenced that with old maps that the British made when Palestine was a British protectorate before 1947. So that's a bit of a long story that I didn't know I was going to go into actually, but I thought I would do something like that with the runaway train children and present evidence. But somewhere along the way, I remembered a book by a French philosopher called Jacques Derrida called The Truth in Painting. Um, and that book, he takes a phrase by Cézanne, who wrote a letter to a friend, saying I owe it to you to tell you the truth in painting and I will tell it to you. Now what happens after that is Derrida, um, he coined this term deconstruction. He deconstructs that to make it seem meaningless. So he says what does he mean by the truth? What does he mean by in painting? What does he mean by the truth in painting? And it, this is over the course of a book, right? He heavily complicates it and Derrida's position is um, that all meaning is contingent or dependent on something something else. And he's kind of saying everything's perspective. And in the 1970s, when he and a lot of other French philosophers were very popular, um, and into the 80s and still on to today, actually, that was seen as very um, radical, anti-authoritarian, challenging authority and therefore good. And especially in the post-war kind of era where after the Second World War, people said, well, we had evidence and rationality and clear thinking and civilization, but it led to Auschwitz and it led to Hiroshima. So maybe we need a little bit less of that. Thank you very much. A little bit less certainty, a little bit less black and white thinking. Uh, I suppose rationally, you could say, um, you can understand a Nazi ideology rationally that exterminating all disabled people is a good thing to breed a race with no disabilities, but it's not very human, is it? So that's kind of where they're coming from. And that was seen as 
um, left wing but critical of Marxist discourse. And I think though today that has kind of contributed to the Trump position because so many people on the political left um, like to um, advance theories where where it depends, you know, it's true for who, true from what perspective, and, and look at power relations. So there's a fame, another famous philosopher called Michel Foucault, and he would typically say, if you were to say, is this true or not? He wouldn't answer the question. He would probably say, why are you asking that question? Why do you want to put it into true and false? What, what's your agenda? What are the power relations and so on? It gets very complicated, um, but, and it doesn't resolve. So I, I started to read that book about 10 years ago, the book I mentioned, The Truth in Painting, and didn't really get anywhere with it because it wasn't what I was after. It wasn't about painting. It was about meaning in language. But I've come back to it now, and I'm interested in, well, what, how could you have a truth in painting? Could I research the stories of these missing people, which I've done in great detail and found some turned up dead, some turned up alive, some are still missing and so on. Some are, are missing, but we're almost certain um, that they're dead and who killed them. Um, and, and through painting, do I, could I have some sort of relationship with that story? You know, is there an emotional connection maybe? Um, I'm talking about the paintings on paper at this point. What's the, you know, is there a truth that's inherent to the medium of painting? Maybe, maybe not. So I did that and that's when I made the 30 paintings, starting with 13 here. There's 12 on the wall and one on the floor around the corner. And I will exhibit it as 12 for aesthetic reasons. It fits better in a grid, but also I think having one missing child missing from the series seems a little bit poetic. So I'm, I'm kind of happy with that. Um, yeah, so I made the paintings and then I had ideas about complicating it further. So if we go back to the other series, I was interested in there's something called the backfire effect. And some psychologists also in America, um, someone, I've forgotten who now, but I know it through an artist. So. There's a German artist called Wolfgang Tillmans who works with post-truth and truth, well, the notion of truth, and he's quoted this backfire effects. And, and the idea is that if someone believes in a conspiracy theory, no matter what evidence you present to them, you won't convince them. In fact, the opposite will happen. It will backfire. They will become um, more and more convinced that they are right. If we go back to Donald Trump, we can see this at work. There's loads of evidence that you're wrong. That's a conspiracy. That's part of the, you know, the liberal media. Um, you would say that. Or, or even down to the level of, you know, if I'm trying, me personally, I'm an academic. I work for a university. If I try to convince a bloke in the pub that he's wrong about something he might view me with suspicion you know you're trying to trick me you're a clever you know what you know your egghead or something from the university i'm just a working man i know that this is true and you're trying to bamboozle me with facts and you might remember in the brexit referendum michael gove said britain's had enough of experts <clears throat> excuse me enough of experts but the question is who do you trust if not experts? And there's, um, there's a comedian called Stuart Lee, and, and I've got a book of his, and in it he prints up this stand-up routine of having a conversation with a homophobic taxi driver in London. So he, the story goes like this. He got in a taxi, the taxi driver quite quickly enters into a conversation with him and says, I think all gay people should be shot or killed. So he says, well, why is that? And the, the guy says, because it's immoral. And then Stuart Lee says, well, morality is not fixed, is it? If you look back at ancient Greek times, um, love between two men was considered to be a highly ethical um, act, um, moral act, if you like. So it, things are not so clear. And the taxi driver says, huh, well, you can prove anything with facts, can't you? Which is the, the punchline of the joke. 
um, yeah, you can prove anything with facts, but I still won't believe it. He's kind of sceptical. Anyway, on to these thoughts. I was, yeah, the backfire effect, that's where I'm going. Um, so if it's true that if I want to advance this like pro-evidence-based agenda, the problem is if I just present evidence saying there is, look, there is a fact, there is a truth, it's um, objective, some truths are objective, like what happened to the missing children, um, don't believe in conspiracies and you know, bigoted opinions, look, at, look for the evidence on it. If I know that will backfire with certain people who will just go, oh, you're, you know, some liberal artist trying to convince me of this, how do I do it? And the way I'm doing it is I'm picking other events from the year 1993 and painting them. So they're all real life events, usually to do with a crime. Um, and you could view them as as types of evidence, you know, I'm, I'm uncovering something if you wanted to. Or you could view it in the vein of a conspiracy theory and say, hang on, this looks like it might be connected. There's something going on here. So the, the series that's behind me, there are nine in a grid. If I come a little bit further away, you can, well, hang on. You can see them there. These are nine terrorists who bombed the World Trade Center in 1993. Um, and when I tell people this, often they think I'm talking about 9-11. So not, to be clear, they drove a car bomb into the basement of the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, and blew it up, but failed to collapse the buildings, obviously. So, Two things happened in 1993, and I've got to show you work in progress now that I'm deeply embarrassed about because it's rubbish uh, and I'm still working on it. The first is, let's go with this one first. Bill Clinton signed NAFTA. NAFTA stands for the North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement. And this was um, controversial because it opens up Mexican markets to the US. And that means the nationalized petroleum company Pemex now has to be able to be, have shares sold to American investors. And it means that the, the Americans can mass produce goods and send it into Mexico undercutting certain prices, making, you know, for example, certain farmers um, can't compete with certain industrially grown grain or, or whatever, um, and it puts them out of business. And also the other way around, they can, they can come in and buy stuff. It kind of works in their favor. And there was, you know, the very following year, there was an armed insurrection um, called the Zapatista movement in Chiapas in the south of Mexico. Um, yeah. And then also in 1993, this man, John Major, signed the Maastricht Treaty. I really hate that painting. That's got a, that's got to be changed. And the Maastricht Treaty essentially um, put us into the European Union. That's the beginning of the European Union. And I'm interested in looking at the fact that Bill Clinton signed this trade deal. And in the same year, there was the first ever Islamic terrorist attack on US soil. And they didn't choose to bomb the White House. They didn't choose to bomb the Pentagon. They chose to bomb the World Trade Center. So a trade deal's done and there's a massive terrorist attack. So by painting the two and putting them together, I'm inviting the audience to say, is, that, is there a connection there or is it completely random? And the same with, um, well, let me give you a slightly different story then. Um, I'm a fan of an artist called John Martin, who was a contemporary of Turner. And he's made a painting called The Fall of Nineveh, also The Fall of Babylon. He's done these paintings of the falls of great civilizations based on Bible stories. And The Fall of Nineveh is interesting because it's a city that, through its love of money, became morally corrupt. And when the soldiers finally broke into the city to, to fight and to capture it, 
the defending soldiers of Nineveh didn't fight at all. They were all drunk. And the king had piled all his wealth into a big funeral pyre, got his harem of wives on there and was about to set fire to it and kill them all. And it's a symbol of a society through its love of money collapsing and falling apart, but also becoming morally corrupt. And in, in Britain in 1993, we didn't have an attack on our stock exchange, but we did have some very high profile um, cases of shocking crimes. So you might even recognize these because the media images are so um, famous. This is two paintings here of Robert Thompson and John Venables, who famously killed Jamie Bolger, a two-year-old boy. They abducted him in Liverpool from a shopping centre and killed him in a very horrific way. And it was hugely shocking because they were about um, 10 or 11 at the time. So I think they were 10 um, because the, uh, I should know this. I, and I did look it up, but I've forgotten. But it, it's to do with the age of um, legal responsibility. And I think they were under that age when they did it. So they're only children and they've done something terrible. And the newspapers really kind of asked questions at the time. Of, what does this say about our society and our morality? You know, how can we get this low? And at the same time, we've just signed this big trade deal, which is all about just you know, money. Um, and I'm not saying the two are, are connected, but I'm inviting audiences to see that. But also Stephen Lawrence was murdered in 1993. And you're probably aware of that because it's been back in the news again recently because of the um, Black Lives Matter movement. And other things happened in 1993 as well. Um, for example, in America, there was a... Um, the reason I'm pausing is I want to say a religious cult, but the point is, was it a religious cult? It's an alleged religious cult called the Branch Davidians in Texas. And they believed that America was becoming morally corrupt and uh, the end of the world is coming almost. And it's going to start with a battle, they thought, when the US government sends in the tanks to attack them. And they did. <laughs> so the um, Department of, it's called something like um, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, which is a strange department to have. But you have to remember that, that in America, um, alcohol was illegal once and Al Capone was like a massive gangster um, running illegal uh, alcohol operations, importing it or making moonshine in Chicago. So we're, we're talking about dealing with the most dangerous criminals, the drug dealers and the alcohol dealers from the 20s or whenever it was. They had this religious, Christian religious sect under surveillance and they found they had lots of weapons, which is not a problem in America, you're allowed to have weapons, but they, some of them are illegal, like um, you can have a shotgun, but you can't have a sawn off shotgun. And, it, and they had some evidence they might be making bombs, so they say. So they sieged Waco. This is the famous image of Waco on fire. Uh, it's a painting of it in 1993. And um, there's a lot of controversy actually about what happened on that first day. Did the government shoot at them first or not? Um, but there was a month long standoff and then eventually the FBI went in with, they weren't tanks, but heavily armoured vehicles. And supposedly the Christians set fire to the place and killed themselves in a strange act of mass suicide. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the FBI had pumped so much tear gas into the building that it could have combusted. So there's a truth about that. And also I'm interested in this idea of the religious truth. They had their truth. They believed something deeply. Um, about the afterlife, about the future. Uh, and I find that interesting. So um, could it be that you view my future exhibition that doesn't exist yet as starting with these two big trade deals, literally forming a new world order, a new economic order, um, and militant armed resistance to it from Christians and from Muslims, could it be that you see uh, moral degradation in Britain uh, with the Bolger murders and so on? Um, Michael Jackson was first accused of child molestation in 1993. It goes on, there's lots of these kind of events. Is that 
coincidence? Is it a constructed truth? Like um, Derrida thinks that all truths are constructed, socially constructed, um, a matter of perspective. Or, yeah, I mean, could this, could I do this with any year, 1994, five, six, eight, whatever? Or is there something in this about um, questioning truth and each one having truths behind it? And I'm going to come to an end now, but the last one is, you may be a bit young for this, but in 1993, the X-Files first went on TV. And I'm interested in the X-Files as well, because um, they... Uh, the tagline is the truth is out there. There's an objective truth and it's out there. But this lady, Dana Scully, is a skeptic. So if she sees evidence of alien abductions, she will always say maybe there's a rational explanation for it. Always look for the scientific answer. Whereas Fox Mulder already believes in alien abduction without the evidence. So he's looking for the evidence to validate his belief. Um, and I think by having, including the X-Files into this, which is the only fictional painting, everything else is uh, based on real life historical events from 1993. I think I can open up debates about what's true, what we believe, why we believe it, how do we trust evidence? Um, you know, Scully has so much evidence, but she still won't really believe it. She'll always think, no, there must be a rational explanation. Um, what are the stories behind my paintings? How do they link with one another? Um, and that's basically it. And, but also, of course, going back to the talk at the beginning, there's that technical aspect of investigating the truth behind the subject matter of the painting. But I'm also inviting the audience to investigate what is the truth in the painting itself? What's it concealing? Um, what mark is analog? What's digital? What's printed? Does it matter? Is a digital mark not real? Is that cheating because I used a computer? Or is it just another type of brushstroke? Do I need to even go into all of that? But it is there and kind of layered within the paintings. And what you've seen today is, um, well, I spent uh, two and a half days just making the canvas stretches, stretching them and priming them. And then I've, I've maybe done about, well, a little bit less than a day of painting actually. So uh, it's work in progress. I hope to have it exhibited in the near future. That's my project. All of it's been done kind of while I'm working at, uni at the university. The print to canvas services here at university, we have loads of other kind of technical facilities. Um, and this is a kind of learning environment that our undergraduate and postgraduate students work in studio space and we're hoping to do more of this in the future especially on the master's degree where Andrew and I who co-lead the program will be working alongside students and the idea is that um, it's a different type of teaching if you remember it started off saying it's a teaching project the first thing we did is we proposed to do no teaching for a week and the idea is that by demonstrating, students will come up to me and say, why are you doing it like that? Or how did you do that? And we can learn from each other and kind of in an egalitarian way, enter into dialogue. And um, so far it's going really well. Brilliant. That's thank all from you. me. <laughs> sorry, I was gonna say, thank you very much for joining us, Martin. I'm really sorry, we do have to cut off now because we, we have another talk starting in the next few minutes, but thank you okay. very much for joining us.